Section 6.3 is partial fractions, which is a really powerful and useful integration technique involving rational expressions and rational functions. Um, it just costs a little bit of algebra, really. Uh, we're going to see systems of equations show up in this. So if you're a little rusty on that, it might be worth a look. But uh, a lot of it can be caught up on as you work on these problems and learn how to do them. So let's just recall that a rational function is a function of the form p of x over q of x, where p of x and q of x are each polynomials. Again, uh, those are a whole number of powers of x uh, with real number multiples in front of them. So x squared plus 3x plus 1, that's a polynomial. Um, x to the fifth minus 7, that's a polynomial. So um, when we stack one polynomial over another one in a fraction, we build a, a rational function. And we can classify them in one of two cases. Uh, we have a proper rational function if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So uh, maybe x squared over x to the fifth is proper because the two is less than the five. We're gonna see this in practice in a moment. And then it's improper otherwise. So uh, if it's equal to or greater than, if the denominators degree is equal to or greater than the numerators, then we have an improper rational function. These classifications are important because we'll only do partial fractions on proper rational functions. And we'll only need to do them on proper rational functions uh, furthermore. So let's have a look real quick at what to do in the case that we don't have a proper rational function. In other words, the numerator has a larger degree than the denominator. And that's the improper case. And we're looking at it right here. We have this integral of x cubed plus x over x minus one dx. Now that's a rational function. We have all whole number positive powers of x with real number coefficients. And when we look, we realize our degree in the numerator polynomial is three. Our degree in our denominator polynomial is one. So the the numerator has a larger degree than the denominator, and that's the improper case. Might have actually stated that in reverse in the previous one. The uh, numerator denominator needs to be, or degree needs to be smaller than the denominator degree uh, for it to be proper. I misstated, I believe, on the previous page. So this is improper because that degree is larger than this one. In other words, it's kind of, kind of a, not a simplified fraction. You might think about it in that sense very loosely. So uh, what to do with this, if we actually wanna integrate this rational function is, well, we need to divide these terms out. We can either use polynomial long division, writing x cubed plus x divided by x minus one. Uh, we might look back to an algebra book for that or some algebra videos for that. Or if we have our denominator is a linear term, x minus one is linear because the power of x is one. So we can just use synthetic division. And remember in synthetic division, you find the zero of this linear term, or in other words, you just take that minus one, make it a positive one and place it in this little half box over here. Now we write out the, the coefficients of x cubed plus x. So x cubed's coefficient is one, x squared's coefficient is zero. It's very important to put the zeros in as the placeholders. x to the first has a coefficient of one, and x to the zero, the constant in this polynomial, has a coefficient of zero because there's no constant and there's no x squared. But those zeros still need to be in that row. Now remember what to do for synthetic division. Uh, we bring this one down to start. Now it's this one times this one is equal to this number. Well, one times one is one. So that's what we end up with that. Now we've got, we add along this column to get one. And we have a one down here. So it's this one times this one. And that's written right here. The result is there. One times one is again one. And we add this column to get two. And then we'll carry out our multiplication again. One times this two is equal to two. And we end up adding that to have two there as well. So now our new polynomial has degree two in the numerator and its coefficients are one x squared plus one x plus two times x to the naught or two 
just two. The remainder in this division is this last number, which is a two also. And we're able to write this down as our quotient is x squared plus x plus two plus our remainder two over our divisor x minus one. So this is kind of the easier path. Dividing polynomials, it might be a little tricky and you might have to catch up on it, but it's not the end of the world. It's not a terribly difficult task. If, he, if you have a linear divisor, a linear denominator, then you can even use synthetic division as we did. And it keeps it a little cleaner, a little bit easier to run through. So we rewrite this term, this rational function as a polynomial plus another rational function. And maybe the case in the future could be that this rational function could be quite a mess. There might be more work to do, partial fractions, trig substitutions, things like that possibly. Uh, unlikely trig substitutions, probably more likely partial fractions. But we can integrate this very easily, right? So that's the nice part. And uh, we can deal with whatever we need to here. In this case, this one won't be so bad and we'll see below. So the integral that we started with, we decompose its integrand into this uh, polynomial. And then we've got this rational function to manage. And we realize that the antiderivative of that polynomial is just these power rules applied to these three terms. When we get to this term, we say, we realize that this is, you know, possibly if we used a u substitution, if u were to be uh, one or x minus one, then we'd have two over u. And we know that, well, that's maybe two times one over u and the antiderivative of one over u is natural log of u. So the a little u substitution to really get through this and carry out the details that I won't do because this is, um, you know, calc two class, not a calc one class. Um, but we arrive at what we've got below. We've got two times natural log of X minus one. So this term here has this as an antiderivative. And you'll find that the U substitution is actually kind of not, it's, it's technically necessary, but in all practicality, um, it doesn't change anything because U being equal to X minus one is actually the derivative is just gonna be one. So DU is equal to DX. So please check that on your own so you're sure of what you're doing in there. Okay, so we're going to see an integral like this show up quite a bit. So let's, uh, let's make sure that we've got this thing locked down for uh, various forms. So these are our preliminary integrals here. So we'll let b uh, be some real number, some constant, and we'll evaluate the integral one over x minus b dx. And here we have that exact u substitution, maybe for a different value of, uh, of b, but this is any value, any real number in this case, some arbitrary real number in this example. So one over x minus b with this u substitution, du derivative with respect to x of both sides is one on the right, du dx becomes du equals one dx. Remember that taking the derivative of this constant b, it, well, b is constant with respect to x, so the derivative of a constant is zero, and that's how we've got our u and our du. So one over x minus b becomes one over u, thanks to our u substitution. And we've got du um, is just dx, so they swap out cleanly. And we've got the integral of one over u du. And of course, we recalled earlier that that's natural log of u plus c. So we can use this generally as a rule. We've kind of written it bigger and boxed it. Uh, we don't have to carry out the details of this every time, uh, maybe every now and then. This might have a coefficient in front of it. If X has a coefficient other than one in front of it, it'll matter. But we see below that it doesn't matter what B is. Um, it's not going to make a difference in the result. So a B can be anything, but X's coefficient needs to be one. If it's not, you might need a U substitution. But if it looks like this, we can quickly pop out with this in the future. So it's just nice to have that around. So one more preliminary integral, uh, we'll let a be a constant and we wanna evaluate the integral one over x squared plus a squared uh, with respect to x. Now this is a good one. Um, it's a good reminder for 6.2. We did not see this in the, in the previous videos for 6.2. We didn't have the x squared plus a squared case or 
Perhaps we did. Anyway, um, whether or not we did, we know what to do. We recognize our form, x squared plus a squared. And we know that x is going to be a tangent theta. That's from the table in 6.2b um, or the textbook, wherever you want to remember, however you want to remember that. Um, or you can take guesses until this portion of things work out. We recommend knowing ahead of time to save time. So um, x squared plus a squared, that's the first thing to check. Does this simplify this integrand in a way that we'll like? In other words, will it take two terms and make them one? In other words, get rid of a plus sign in there. And we see if x is going to be this and x squared is going to be a squared tangent squared theta then, and then plus a squared. We have a factor of a squared in both of these terms, so we factor it away. We have tangent squared theta plus one. And the reason we do that is because we're looking for a Pythagorean identity. And that one, in fact, is secant squared theta. Again, having those lists of trig identities around is very helpful in, this, in these problems. So a squared secant squared theta is our denominator. And we should probably feel pretty good about the fact that we've uh, simplified our denominator, denominator in a way that might be useful to us. The last thing to do is realize that we're going from x to theta in terms of variables. So we need to find dx in terms of theta. That's the derivative of this with respect to theta. So we have dx d theta equals a secant squared theta. Then we multiply both sides by d theta. So now we have a very nice clean substitution for dx and it's a secant squared theta d theta. So let's plug that into our integral now. So here's dx up above, a secant squared theta d theta, and down below x squared plus a squared we've worked out is a squared secant squared theta. And lucky us, secant squared theta cancels with secant squared theta over the division bar. We're left with one over a. And maybe we should have specified that a is not zero in this problem. Um, that's the only one that this would not work for. But anyway, we can move on. We have one over a times theta is the antiderivative of this uh, one d theta in here. And then plus c for a constant of integration. And when we go to clean this up, we realize that we need to find theta in terms of x. So we need to move back up to the top. And there's not really always a triangle that we need to pursue here. We can just recall that this line, x equals a tangent theta, is tangent theta equals x over a, dividing a by both sides. And then solving for theta, remember our trig equations, we just take arctangent of both sides, and we have that theta is equal to arctangent of x over a, or inverse tangent of x over a. And there we have it we have our clean substitution for this. Now, whatever A was, that'll be a number that we'll just use um, going forward in these problems, but this is a nice, um, quick, handy thing to have available to us as we work on these. Okay, so now let's see our first partial fractions decomposition. So what we need is we need to be sure first in any one of these problems, when we look at an integral, that we have a proper rational function if it's improper, we need to use the method that we've already seen to uh, reduce it to a polynomial plus possibly a proper rational function as a remainder. Okay, so here's the technique in the box. Uh, we've got P of X over Q of X as our rational function. Q of X, um, in the case we're looking at here, case one, uh, the denominator factors into a product of linear factors. So in other words, every one of these x values down here, once we've factored q fully, is first power of x, okay? They might repeat themselves, but we'll see that in case two, but just first powers of x in all cases. There are no x squareds or no x cubes, anything like that. So that's what we mean by that, okay? Our decomposition looks like the following. Uh, we might not always use a1s, a2s, things like that. Um, we we'll use a and b when the problems are smaller. But this could go on indefinitely, so this numbered uh, accordingly. Now, um, in this case, we'll only ever have a constant. And we're not going to know this constant to begin with. We want to split a function like p of x over q of x into something that we can integrate more easily. 
and we'll see that in the example below. So we don't know these constants, but we write our original function and we put this equal sign and we say it's some constant I don't know over this linear factor plus some constant I don't know over this linear factor. And we go until we've exhausted all our linear factors and now we have to solve for those constants. So we'll see that technique um, when we get started with this example. So the motivation for this is to look at the first example and realize we don't know an antiderivative to this right away. We don't know what this integral is from calc one. Uh, the integral of two over x squared minus one, there's no closed quick form for that. There's no u substitution that gets us out of this. Um, possibly x squared minus one, that could be a trig substitution form that we might be able to do it that way, but it's just as well to do partial fractions on this. And uh, many problems will need partial fractions specifically and nothing else will get us out of the mess. So we see the first step, uh, well, really the first step is to confirm that it's in fact proper. Is the numerator degree less than the denominator degree? And in this case, the numerator degree, the degree of two is just zero. The highest power of X up there is X to the zero. And the denominator it's two. So this is a proper rational function. We can proceed with partial fractions. Now, the main step in partial fractions to begin with is to factor the denominator. Well, that's a difference of squares. It factors into x minus one times x plus one. So we've done our job of factoring q into its linear factors. And now what, we, what we're guaranteed for uh, partial fraction decomposition is that this function, two over x minus one times x plus one will decompose into a over x minus one plus b over x plus one, where a and b are two real numbers that we just don't know yet. We need to find them. And this is essentially the crux of partial fraction decomposition is finding those constants. And it's not that it's very hard work, it's just uh, somewhat tedious. We have to solve linear equations and uh, systems of linear equations, and we have to be very careful with the details. So notice we've drop the integral sign for now. We're not worried about the integral for the time being until we know what a and b are, we won't look at this integral again. Of course, to finish the problem, we'll have decomposed things as we, we'd like to see here, and then we can integrate. So um, we notice that we can multiply both of these sides of this equation by the denominator on the left, and we do so, and we see some cancellations happening. Here's the denominator on the left multiplied by both sides. Uh, distributed to a, the, the a rational function and the b rational function. x minus one cancels with this denominator. This cancels with this denominator. And simplifying for the next line, we see that we've got a times x plus one to, uh, plus b times x minus one. And all that's equal to two. So distribute a across this term, b across this term, and we get the result on the right here collect the like terms, and we'll see why in just a moment, collect the like terms, ax plus bx gives us a plus bx, and plus a and a minus b gives us a minus b, and we have our like terms, our like powers of x, and constant, uh, uh, like first power of x and, and the constant term are here. And what we can say is that if the left-hand side of this polynomial, which is a basic polynomial two, but it's still a polynomial. If it's going to be equal to this right-hand side, as it is, then all of these terms need to line up. Well, what that means, and we've even wrote, written a little extra bit here, zero X plus two, because it's understood to be in front of that two all along. What that means is that A plus B times X, well, there's no X over here. So A plus B has to be zero. So there's our first linear equation that comes out of this. The second thing we do is we line up the constant terms and say two on the left-hand side, these are our only constant terms. In other words, things that don't involve X. So A minus B needs to be equal to two for this equality to hold. In other words, for these decompositions to be what they are, these two equations that we arrive at in the bottom right have to hold. And uh, so long as we pick the right form, this will always work out for us. 
Now uh, we need to solve this linear of equations. We have two variables, a and b, and two equations. So we're all set to find a unique solution to this. If there is one, and if we set it up right, there will be one. And here's the continued work on that. Remember with a linear equation, we can add them. And I've decided to just add a plus b equals zero to a minus b equals two. And when we do so, the a's add up to 2a, the b and negative b add up to zero, and this is equal to two. So 2a is equal to two is that resulting equation. So that means a is one. And now that a is one, remember in systems of linear equations, you can go back to this equation or this equation, whichever you prefer, plug a in, looks like we've taken the first, written this down, we've plugged a in and a is one, so one plus b equals zero, so b is negative one. So now we've got, we've got both a and b. We can fully write our decomposition. So our original integral becomes a over x minus one, so one over x minus one, minus b, or plus b over x plus one. So there's negative one plus negative one over x plus one for the b portion. Go back to the previous page, just confirm that that was actually the case. Um, a was over x minus one, b was over x plus one. Um, it's a silly mistake, but it happens a lot to flip these terms around. They're not interchangeable. A is positive one, b is negative one. They need to go in their correct places. And that's what we've got uh, here and here. Okay, so to finish this up, there's actually two integrals. We split it over the sum, or really this will become a minus sign right here. So we've got one integral minus another integral. And both of those are one over x minus b forms. So we can pop out of this quite quickly. This just becomes the natural log of x. And this one is one minus sign out front, but the natural log of um, x plus one. So to repeat that, that was natural log of x minus one for this minus the natural log of x plus one. Um, again, x minus b forms or x plus b forms. Integral signs are gone. We didn't forget our constant of integration and we're done with this one, our first version of the partial fraction decomposition method. Uh, now, we'll see three more, and that will be another linear version where we have repeat linear factors, and then we'll see when we have irreducible quadratics what to do for partial fraction decomposition. It's not so much a difficult thing to do in terms of uh, solving a problem, it's just tedious work and really being good with the bookkeeping of taking care of all these terms and these systems of equations. So I really recommend taking it slow for all of these, learning all the steps. You will learn some shortcuts, but don't be in a hurry to get to those. So we'll, uh, the next, second video to follow this, we'll finish up our next three cases.